I think that when we die, uh... oh, that's a big question. For the past few years, one University of Chicago professor has driven around the United States asking people two questions. What do you want done with your body when you die? I would like to be buried with a tree planted on top of me so that I can continue in some sort of a positive state. And what do you think happens to us after we die? I believe in a like weird version of reincarnation. Well, I think the death rituals really uh, reveal a lot about the cosmology, the way, the way that people think about the world and about the human relationship to the cosmos. That's anthropologist and historian Shannon Lee Doughty. But also uh, social stratification, social relations, all kinds of ideas are embedded or buried with the dead that you can excavate and analyze. So it really is quite revelatory about living cultures. Most anthropologists dig up ancient sites to learn about the cultures of the past. And I thought, well, why can't we do this with our contemporary culture? Dottie set off on a journey across the country, studying what our death practices and rituals say about America today. Use that mortuary archeology span viewpoint. Ask what's going on with the dead? How are people treating the dead? And what does this say about the living? She documents these changes in her new book, American Afterlives. And our death rituals have been changing a lot. According to one funeral director that Dottie met, American death practices have changed more in the last 10 years than the last 100. And what you're seeing is a transition from a very orthodox, accepted, mainstream, one-size-fits-all, 95% of all Americans in the 20th century had one kind of death ritual. Now it's going to a heterodox pattern where it's kind of anything goes. From the University of Chicago Podcast Network, this is Big Brains, a podcast about the pioneering research and the pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, what American death rituals say about who we are. I'm your host, Paul Rand. You have probably already heard some of the new and unique things that people are doing to commemorate the dead. From making jewelry out of their remains to even mixing ashes with paint to create art. And while these practices might strike some as strange, it may surprise you to learn that historically America's death rituals have always been considered a bit weird to the rest of the world. Well, one of the most distinctive features that goes back to the 1700s, Americans were very interested in viewing the corpse you would have a home funeral or a home viewing for about three days. Hmm. The body would stay in the parlor. Or in a... Three days. Wow. Yeah. And uh, one of the things seems to be rooted whether or not people were practicing Christians, but rooted in a, in a Christian idea that's also a romantic idea about the reunification of family members in heaven. You need to be able to memorize what they look like because you don't know how many years or decades it will be before you'll see them again. And uh. pre, pre-photography, you kind of had to sear that image in your mind. This led, in fact, to post-mortem photography in the Victorian era, something that people find kind of macabre, but its purpose was to remind you so you can find your loved one in mm. the, the crowded spaces of heaven. There are plenty of historical documents from immigrants and visitors discussing this uniquely American need to view the corpse after death. But what was considered really strange to the rest of the world was the practice of embalming, a practice you may be surprised to learn actually started with the Civil War. A number of things converged at once. First, you have, you know, in the mid-19th century, we get a rise of technology and science and a lot of interest in, in scientific practice and medicine. With the war, people were sent off to die. And they were sent off to die, particularly northern soldiers, to a strange land. (laughs) The South was really considered a strange land by um, people in the North. And the families demanded those bodies come back. And before refrigeration, there was no real good way to do that, where they had already been experimenting with embalming for medical dissection, you know, to learn about the body for medical uh, education. But this just went into um, hypergear with a couple of innovators around the Civil War in order to facilitate getting those casualties home. But what may have solidified embalming as a ubiquitous American practice was the death of an American president. Abraham Lincoln's body after his assassination was famously embalmed and treated cosmetically to look like he was just sleeping. 
and thousands and upon thousands of Americans saw his embalmed body as it made the funeral train from Washington, D.C. back to Illinois. Hmm. And, and that went to a different purpose, which wasn't just to keep the body from decaying any further, but actually to make it look beautiful, to be reassured that they're going someplace where they're going to be in peace, they're going to rest in peace. And that became an enduring theme in uh, American practice. It also stands out as rather unusual. Embalming is a specialized task, and the increasing demand for it after the Civil War established our modern funeral industry today. For decades, embalming and viewing of the corpse in a funeral setting became the dominant practice for 95% of Americans, even though it was incredibly rare everywhere else on the planet. This led to a belief that Americans use embalming to deny the reality of death, a denial that many people think runs through our culture. Yeah, I think that's my biggest argument is with this very dominant narrative that um, that Americans deny death, that the, viewing the embalmed body and, and creating this kind of sleeping beauty type of death was a kind of disnification of death, as if people are just sleeping, they're not really dead. But as I kept doing my research, I was willing to believe that, but as I kept doing my research, I came to doubt that significantly. And I think there's actually a lot of, basically, people were literally looking death uh, in the face when they looked at the corpse. That's more of a confrontation and an acceptance. Rather than a denial. Right. But the ubiquity of embalming in America began to change drastically in the 21st century with a massive shift toward cremation. So what happened? Well, Dottie traces this surprising trend to the September 11th attacks in 2001. So with 9-11, one of the things that happened, of course, it was televised throughout the country, throughout the world. These are the facts as we know them. What President Bush has called apparent terrorist attacks, two airplanes at separate times not far apart, hit the World Trade Centers. The World Trade Center buildings have collapsed. About 50,000 people work, generally speaking, in those 110-story buildings at the tip of Manhattan. Human remains were incinerated um, through the fires and explosion, and ash rained down on those below. In the days following the September 11th attacks, that debris and the unending search for bodies. Now a decade later, efforts to identify human remains recovered from that site still continue. Victims could never be recovered or identified even through tiny, tiny fragments. 20 years later, 40% of the victims are still unaccounted for. And so I think it really let people let go of the body, that we don't need the body present in order to mourn and to grieve. The cremation rate between 2000 and 2015 has doubled, um, and I, so I think that was a, a, a major transition. She also thinks that 9-11 changed America's relationship with grief. 9-11 being in a really important turning point in terms of an acceptance of the public expression of, of grief and of public mourning. What, what do you mean by that? You saw people doing public mourning out in the streets. Overnight, a first flower was laid under this maple tree across the street, and it has grown and grown throughout the day. Every five minutes, people are showing up to lay a flower. There's pictures of the Twin Towers in a framed photograph. Putting flowers and pictures on the chain link fences around, around Manhattan, really, not just at Ground Zero. We've seen the unfurling of flags, the lighting of candles, the giving of blood. The saying of prayers in English, Hebrew, and Arabic. We have seen the decency of a loving and giving people who have made the grief of strangers their own. And I think this really turned the tide that people realized that, that those who were affected by this incredible tragedy needed the support of the American people. That meant accepting their and recognizing their grief and uh, encouraging them to mourn and not, uh, not telling them, well, just get over it, or that's embarrassing. If national tragedies and crises reshape our death practices, how are the events of today, climate change and COVID-19, changing Americans' relationship to death? Well, that's after the break. Big Brains is supported by the University of Chicago Graham School. Are you a lifelong learner with an insatiable curiosity? Join us at Graham and access more than 50 open enrollment courses every quarter in literature, history, religion, science, and more. We open the doors of UChicago to learners everywhere. 
expand your mind, and advance your leadership. Online and in-person offerings are available. Learn more at graham.uchicago.edu slash bigbrains. If embalming was symbolic of pre-9-11 America and cremation post-9-11, Dottie would call what we're seeing today the era of individualization. A do-it-your-own-way, DIY funerals, but also DIY ritual, where what's meaningful to people is a totally unique ritual that somehow reflects the, the individual who passed away. Often, these individualized funerals involve the creation of physical remembrances, jewelry or glass ornaments that are made from the remains of the deceased. I mean, I actually really struggled to come up with my my own words for them because I didn't want to call them objects because for a lot of people, they're not just objects, they're subjects, they're people. They talk to grandma or, you know, their husband through these objects. They refer to a ring as Mary. They don't refer to it as the ring. There's not uh, yet a standardized term for them. Paintings, which are also a really interesting phenomenon. Paintings using the remains. Correct. Okay. And there's also, it sounds like, tattoos. Yes. Technically not legal, as far as I know, although there's one partnership that's trying to make it legal in the state of Ohio. I don't know if they've had much luck. So taking a little bit of of, um, cremated remains, which are pretty sterile, inert materials, uh, and inject them in injecting them into the ink. And clearly there's just something symbolic about taking Mm -hmm. that person's physical matter into your own body so that they're always with you. But not all of these remembrances are purely sentimental. There's even a new practice that could serve practical purposes as well, preserving a bit of encased DNA from the deceased. They process it in such a way that it's actually visible to the human eye. When you separate DNA strands for medical purposes, you still need a very powerful microscope to see it. But they they did something like making other uh, materials attached to the DNA so you can actually see something that looks like a little bit of a helix, and it's suspended in liquid. Um, the company I interviewed have different versions, some of which are just pretty, and you can put in a ring, and they're inert. But others, they claim, can be reactivated. They, I mean, they talk about for future medical needs, um, say, an inherited medical condition, you want to kind of check the family archive, and you can check um, great-grandma's DNA to see if she had that gene. But I think there's also an imaginary of... Um, resurrection of, uh, of cloning somebody in the future. If death practices reveal what we hold sacred, nothing could point to the dominance of individuality more than the preserving of the unique DNA of a loved one. This is physical, natural, biological proof that each individual is absolutely unique. And so it's, it confirms this belief in, could say, the singularity, the absolute uniqueness of the individual. And so that to have some trace of that genetic uniqueness through a DNA sample is to have a a blueprint of that special individual. And that individualism has really become a sacred concept more than a social convention and tradition. But should we be worried about this trend? As Dottie writes in the book, this breakdown of a unifying national ritual could suggest that the United States is falling apart as a cultural unity. With social and economic um, currents, I think it's just intensified over time. Uh, It's now a kind of uh, hyper-individualism. Consumer culture teaches us that we're all completely unique individuals, and there's something sacred about the individual. That's, you know, codified in U.S. law, too, uh, which makes the U.S. a bit different. And I think that sacredness of the individual you know, it just starts to build where that sacredness can't just end. If it truly is sacred, it transcends the limitations of the body. I I think that sacred individuality that still unifies us, even if um, the death rituals aren't. One trend that has followed the breakdown of our unified death rituals into individualized practices has been the loss of religion. So does this point toward death of spirituality in American life? When I started off studying this, I thought what we were seeing was a transition to secular death. Mm. But this is one of the things where I had to correct myself. Because the more that I learned and the more I talked to people, what I realized is that it wasn't that it was becoming less religious or more secular. It's that it was becoming more spiritual. Spirituality is extremely important and underlies a drive for a need for spiritual um, 
Meaning is really driving these new rituals. First off, let me, let me pause you on that one. Tell me what you mean by spirituality in this sense. Make sure we're kind of thinking about it on the same lines. Well, I think, I mean, one of the things that's hard about talking about spirituality is it means different things to different people. The dating app, okay, okay Cupid, has an option that you can tick, like uh, identifying your religion, or probably its most popular box that could be ticked is spiritual but not religious. Okay. And there's been a number of um, surveys that Pew Charitable Trust does these perennially that shows a pretty rapid rise in people identifying that way. The percent of Americans who identify with any religion has been on the decline for decades. And a recent Pew Research Center study has found the biggest generational drop-off is with millennials. As to why, I mean, that's when I become the speculative philosopher. I would guess that climate change and a lot of the, the sense of crisis that the, the media feeds, um, you know, that there is something like an existential, uh, a collective existential crisis going on. Huh. Um, you know, our political tor- turmoil the last several years, too, I think um, really makes people question what it means to be American, such mm-hmm. that the, the rituals that used to unite us are no longer working. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the um, the old uh, American uh, funeral rite. Um, people just aren't identifying with it anymore. And so this search for a greater connectivity to something larger than ourselves is, is in essence what we're talking about with spirituality here. Yes, but also I would say it's a revival of old American spiritualism from the 1800s, the kind where you have seances Uh, and Ouija boards, and you talk to people uh, on the other side. I have a cousin that passed away. I have felt him sit on my bed with my my grandfather. My grandmother on my father's side had ghosts in their house. So the spirit runs free in my family. And so I think a lot of these practices are uh, uh, like, for example, um, cremation jewelry, diamonds, and other objects that are created with the remains of your loved one. Why they wanted them is so that, so that they could talk to the dead. Uh, maybe that's the way life moves on. And maybe that's what life is. It's that spirit and memory that moves from one physical thing to the next. And this has only increased in the wake of COVID-19. If 9-11 completely upended our society's relationship with death and grief, what effect will something as huge as the COVID pandemic have? That was one of the challenges for finishing writing the book because the the last two chapters I was working on in in the spring and summer of 2020. And I had that very question. How is this going to change everything all over again? Is my book going to be uh, old before it's done, old news? What I did is I did follow-up interviews with a number of the people that have been my interlocutors over the years. The ones I did get in touch with particularly the innovators, that it's just more of the same. Like, people want more cremation objects and, uh, and jewelry, for example, to substitute for not being able to gather. So instead of everyone gathering around the dead, the dead goes out in different pieces, mm. in, say, 20 pieces of cremation jewelry, to everyone who otherwise might have um, gathered in an extended family ritual. It also has people thinking about death. I mean, it's just in the headlines every single day for two years. And so if you perhaps didn't deny your own death, but if you just deferred thinking about it, a whole lot more pre-planning happening where Mm. people are exploring their options, um, figuring out what they want. Another massive crisis that is shifting American death practices is climate change. Now we see the rise of green burial and uh, it's on a very, very fast trajectory. Dottie saw growing popularity for this type of funeral everywhere she went and from a variety of people that she interviewed. Being pumped up with formaldehyde and being put into a cement vault and, and, you know, this coffin, it doesn't sound appealing to me at all. Green burial means being buried in the ground with no embalming. Less permanence with the body, the better, I think, once I'm gone. And sometimes no coffin at all. It's the death of denial, because when you wrap a body in a shroud, you see the outline of grandma. You know that grandma or whoever you put in the ground is going to be eaten by microbes, and you're good with that. You're good with the moisture. You're good with the decomposition, where for someone in denial, that's like a horror movie. 
So the 5% that never went along with embalming tended to be in the 20th century Orthodox and conservative Jews and Muslims. By religious tradition, the prescribed practice is no embalming and to be buried within 24 hours and with minimal uh, and very natural, either a shroud or uh, a wooden coffin with no nails. 100% biodegradable. Hmm. Now more and more people are doing that for a different kind of devout practice, which is to want to do no harm, which is a different rationale than the economic one of going to cremation because it's cheap and you don't use that. Uh -huh. There is this, under, you know, I would call it a, real, a kind of a misunderstanding that to take up a cemetery plot has a, a negative environmental or economic impact. It might be different in island nations like the UK or Japan, where people do run out of space. But in the US, there's plenty of cheap space out in the suburbs and beyond. Um, so you might have to travel a little bit, but yeah. there's pl plenty of space out there um, for the dead. But in green burial, you don't want the embalming fluid because it's quite poisonous and it has, has seeped into groundwater. And the, the metal and the concrete and other things that are used in the traditional cemetery uh, burial are very permanent. They're not very biodegradable. It will take thousands of years for everything to break down. Mm -hmm. Then on the other side, there's cremation, which a lot of people, again, misunderstand, I think, as a greener option. Uh, than an embalmed burial, but it takes a huge amount of fossil fuels to get those furnaces hot enough, and all of that carbon goes up into the air. Mm. Um, so as education starts to kind of make its way into people's decisions, um, and the earlier that it, they get that information, the more likely they are to um, opt for green burial if, if they can. Demand far outpaces supply right now in terms okay. of green burials. But yeah, I would if, if I were forecasting or um, recommending investment, I would say green burial is where it's at for sure. And and you still need the same amount of space. It's just what goes into the ground is going to be different. And you can reuse that space once it's all decomposed. Right, and you don't have to own it either. It could be in a a, a natural um, forest or landscape where you don't own the plot but you're feeding tree, native trees. We started this podcast with the two questions that Dottie asked every person she interviewed. What do you want done with your body when you die? And what do you think happens after we die? It seems fitting that we should end our interview with those questions as well. Sure. Maybe you can answer them for me. Oh, I was afraid you were going to ask that, but okay. <laughs> what surprised me is almost the younger the person was, the more prepared they were with an answer on the body question. Younger people have really thought about this more than older people, which is fascinating to me. Hmm. And what, we ha what happens after we die also surprised me how few people refer to a classic Christian heaven out of you know, dozens and dozens, over a hundred people, only two Americans I interviewed, and I went, you know, north and south, east and west, only two Americans really described that classic Christian idea of heaven. The biggest percentage, would you say, fell into what category then? We don't know. It's the great mystery, but I believe something of us continues on. Okay. Um, funeral directors love that one. <laughs> um, uh, no one has come back to tell us. And then the other thing that surprised me is a really common belief in some form of reincarnation. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I'm assuming you have quick answers at the ready for those two questions for yourself. What I want done with my body when I die, I would like a green burial uh, okay. with a few artifacts and maybe in an archive somewhere I'll put a hint for future archaeologists of where they can dig me up. I would like to become an archaeological discovery uh, a few hundred years from wow, now. Wow, that's, that's a good one. Uh, what happens to us after we die? You know, I read a lot of, uh, in my very limited free time, I read some speculative fiction, and I was also, um, early in my life, a physics major. Okay. So I do believe in the pluriverse, multiple universes, and time dimensions. And so I would like to believe that there are different versions of us, slightly different versions of us in the pluriverse out there. I don't know that there's an essential part that's me, but there are other me's out there. All right, super. Thank you very much, Shannon. We'll be in touch soon. All right, Paul, you got away with that answering the questions. <laughs> we so. timed it perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Hello, Big Brains listeners. The University of Chicago Podcast Network is excited to announce the launch of a new show. It's called Entitled, and it's about human rights. Co-hosted by lawyers and New Chicago Law School professors Claudia Flores and Tom Ginsburg, Entitled explores the stories around why rights matter and what's the matter with rights. Big Brains is a production of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and a review. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarine. Thanks for listening.